um, and I'll just jump in and I'll be monitoring the uh, the chat box. So go ahead. Sounds good. All right. So I think that we left, you know, the last talk that I did was about the importance of detecting macular degeneration early and the things that we can do about it. So as the optometrist or the primary eye care co provider, really I have two goals in this day and age to manage macular degeneration. So goal number one is to find it early, detect it early, educate patients, get them on the lifestyle changes, and hopefully prevent any vision loss or issues down the road is hope number one and goal one. Goal two then, once you are diagnosed with macular degeneration, especially when we're in the intermediate forms of macular degeneration, my second goal is to make sure that if you do convert from dry to wet, which happens about 15% of the time, that we catch that as early as we possibly can, because we know from the studies that whatever vision you're diagnosed at with wet, that conversion, and we start anti-VEGF treatments, it's about the same visual acuity one and two years later with all of those treatments, which means if we catch it really early, you know, better than 2040 vision, the chances of you being 2040 in two years from now are pretty high. You know, on the flip side, if it's undetected for a long time, but then you're, you know, to that legally blind stage 2200 or worse, that's also about where your vision is two years later. So sort of like AREDS, the anti-VEGF goal is to stop it from getting worse. Because once that fluid is there, even though, you know, everybody will look at the OCTs, of course, to detect if fluid is there or not. But once the fluid is there, we're already damaging some of the rods and the cones and their axons at the cellular level. So most scientists consider the retina a direct extension of the brain. And you consider, you know, strokes and brain damage and that kind of stuff that we know there's some rehab that can happen, but it's never quite the same afterwards. And that's really what happens in the retina too, is that you have this bleed or you have fluid build up in the retina. The injections will make it look better on the LCT. It'll make it seem a little less distorted sometimes, but overall quality of that central vision is still just not perfect after you have any kind of fluid, even if the OCT looks beautiful, you know, years down the road with treatment. So my goal as the primary care eye doctor, optometry or general ophthalmology, is to also catch that conversion from dry to wet as early as possible and thus, you know, preserve our patient's vision more with that over the time too. So that's goal number two. And then goal number three is that if you convert to wet, that you're with a good retina specialist who's talking about how to treat it, the different types of anti-VEGF, as you know, you know in your group that there's new treatments and modalities coming out to manage this too. So making sure there's somebody on your team watching the fluid. And then typically we do like a treat and extend protocol that if you're dry for a little while and the fluid's pretty good, then we back it up another week, you know, et cetera, with the anti vegia So the hope with the new technologies at home that we can use, both what's available now, this 4C home device, can now detect early wet macular degeneration super early, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit. And then what should be coming sometime this year pending FDA approval is actually home OCT, which will be really neat. And that's gonna be more approved for those already with wet, wet macular degeneration for the retina specialist to use to hopefully like treat and extend that further. Or if you leak sooner than your scheduled office visit that they could bring you in sooner and do injections. So again, that fluid isn't there causing that permanent, permanent damage to the retina, which would you know, decrease your vision over time. So that's the gist of where we're at. So I just wanna go through some things as to why the 4C home device is actually better and is proven better than the Amsler grid. And that's because with the Amsler grid, sort of like if you think about an optical illusion a little bit, that if the area of distortion is super teeny tiny, by looking at that grid over and over again for weeks or months or years sometimes, your brain knows what it's supposed to look like. Like it knows that there are vertical lines, there's horizontal lines back and forth. And that if you have just a really small defect, you'll miss it because of something we call cortical completion, which is essentially your eye actually sees the distortion, but your brain doesn't think that makes sense. So your perception of it is that it's normal. Mm -hmm. So they've shown that bleeds less than six degrees, which is more meaningful to us than to you, but bleeds less than six degrees 
really are never caught by the by the ambler grid. So it's missing the really, really early ones. Once it gets to the point that it is causing distortions on the ambler, it's typically greater than a six degree um, bleed, which I can show too. But why this is so important is because we have really poor outcomes right now currently with managing wet AMD. Well, with diagnosing it early in order to manage wet AMD. So right now the statistics are to be 2040 or better at your initial diagnosis of wet AMD is only happening 33% of the time, which means two thirds of the time people are being diagnosed with wet AMD with already significant vision loss. 2040 is sort of a reasonable, uh, kind of across the board, it differs state by state, but 2040 is the line that you need to see to be able to le legally drive in your better seeing eye. Most states, it varies a little bit. So that 2040 cutoff is really important for people's lifestyle and, and how they're managing their own lives in their everyday situation. It's a huge cutoff for me. So we're doing a really poor job at that. And there's lots of reasons for it. You know, some of it is it's hard to diagnose AMD. And it'd be interesting to talk about that or make a little blurb for you after a while, because it's hard for us to diagnose and see the early stuff, the subtle things. And even we grade severity of macular degeneration, early, intermediate, late, pretty much by the ARED study. They gave us guidelines as to what that is. And intermediate macular degeneration, the only, there's two qualifications to be intermediate. One, you only need to have one druse, but they consider it a large druse. You only need to have one. So you can have that one druse pretty easily overlooked as we're just looking in and, you know, moving the light across. And, you know, I'll be honest, I've been guilty of it myself, that if the light is too bright, like say we look in and we're just trying to look at the big structures, if the light's too bright, you like bleach out those tiny druses as you go across. So I'm used to changing my light beam as I go. But if you're just doing a sweep, not expecting to see something, not looking for the subtleties, how easy is it to miss? It's super easy on our end, to be totally honest. So that's one. And then two, I think eye care as a whole isn't doing enough to educate our patients about it. So my like worst fear is that a patient of mine comes back and they're like, well, I noticed my vision changed, but I knew I had an appointment with you in two months, so I'm just going to wait it out. Like that is explicitly from me stated, like, don't ever, please ever let that happen. But if patients aren't explicitly told that, I totally see why that would happen. I've had, you know, pain in my shoulder or whatever. I'm like, oh, I have an appointment with my primary doctor in a month or two. I'll just, I'll just wait it out. I'm not going to urgent care, this and that. So I, I get the reasoning from the patients if they don't have the education as to why we need to know about that as soon as possible. Um, even I've seen that with changes in the Amsler grid. They're like, but I knew I was seeing you in three weeks. So a lot can happen in three weeks with the leakage. So the 4C home device is the at-home device now that we're using to monitor dry converting to wet. And what it's looking for is similar to what the Amsler grid is looking for with regards to um, metamorphopsia. So the medical term metamorphopsia is when you see something um, like irregular, sort of like a fun house. So on the Amsler grid, it's like the lines get wavy or back and forth or like missing, distorted. Um, that's metamorphopsia. And it happens because typically the retina is a pretty intact structure with all of the, the uh, layers together. But as that fluid accumulates, you know, parts of it thicken with edema, parts of it are not as thick. And so you have this actual like groove or bump, this fluid built up in the tissue of the retina. And that's what you're looking through and seeing. So depending on which portion has more fluid, that also changes those perfectly straight lines that are up and down on the Amsler grid. So it's the same concept with the 4C home device that they're looking for changes in vision as opposed to changes in like the macula anatomy. So although if the 4C home does have a change and it alerts me, so it communicates with me as the doctor, I would call that patient and bring them in. I have seen them both convert to wet, but I've also seen changes in their retina that is just causing metamorphopsia that has nothing to do with wet um, macular degeneration. So it gives us an in increased knowledge of what's going on at home, and then we bring you in and, and check it. Yes. So this has been asked uh, sometimes in the group. S seeing wavy lines, does that immediately mean you have wet AMD? It sounds like you're saying not always. Not always. So it means you're having metamorphopsia, mm -hmm. um, which can be caused from lots of things. So wet macular degeneration is the most 
um, concerning thing, we'll say, especially when you're diagnosed with macular degeneration. But it can also occur in like diabetic retinopathy. It can occur like my one patient who had a false um, positive on the 4C home that I brought in. He had something called an epiretinal membrane where like tissue grows on top of the retina and it can like pucker and kind of squeeze and again, distort the retina, like causing that metamorphopsia. So there's definitely other things that cause it. But to me, like when you have a diagnosis of macular degeneration and you call and you say, hey, I'm having some wavy lines or something. It's like, well, let's check it because it could be anything. But my, my highest concern right now, knowing the dry AMD diagnosis is the conversion to wet. So in other words, uh, uh, they shouldn't panic if they start to see wavy lines, but they should call, absolutely call. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And that, you know, the wet AMD, it's definitely sooner than better to address. Um, but typically, you know, you have a couple of days of wiggle room. It's not going to like burst and bleed in like 24, 48 hours. You'll see changes more over a week to two weeks. So um, it's not like you have to panic and be seen the exact same day. But, you know, if it was a Friday and the office is closed, I'd like you to be seen Monday, you know, kind of situation or sometime during the week. Okay, we have a question. Can a large druse moving closer to the macula cause wavy lines? Yep, and it can. So I have some really, like some, you know, yucky, like big, large druse, and, and even just built up across the macula that also can cause um, metamorphopsia on both the Amsler grid and on the 4C home device. So when I dispense an Amsler grid to a patient, I will have them do it in front of me during the exam, you know, cover one eye, do the other, and answer my questions. And then I'll tell them, I say, okay, well, today we checked your OCT and we looked at your dilated exam. There is no leakage. All right. So what's there now is going to be there now, you know, probably from either the drusen or sometimes early atrophy if you're progressing in the dry form. So we know what there is now is your baseline. So now I want to know, is there changes from there? And mm -hmm. the 4C home device does the same thing. So the first time you get the device, it checks you over a period of three to five days to understand your baseline. So it's not just the same for everybody. Um, it individualizes it to you. So whatever your baseline is, and I tell them initially when I'm prescribing it, it's not wet right now, it's intermediate, then they know that that baseline is normal for that person, depending on whatever the retina status is. And then we're looking from, for change from that point forward. And you know, you might have a change in your Amsler grid, you know, years down the road because of the drusen changes, because the atrophy gets worse. And then again, I say the same thing. All right, there's changes to it. It's different from a few years ago, but there's no leakage. It's from drusen, atrophy, epiretinal membrane, you know, whatever. Today is your new baseline. And now I want to know if there's changes from there. Gotcha. Very good. So um, the 4C home device, as that was undergoing its study, which ended up being real world performance of self-operated home monitoring system, for macular degeneration. What the, um, it was a very interesting study. So they put patients into two groups, which is either the 4C monitoring at home device, which they were asked to do <clears throat> at least five days a week, or standard of care. So it was the 4C home device or standard of care. Standard of care was whatever the doctor recommended. So sometimes it was an Amsler grid, sometimes it was just monitoring, sometimes it was education. So it was just like standard of care as it is now. And what they found was um, they had a 81% of patients had better than 20-40 vision using that device. And I think the really interesting part of that is that um, the, the monitoring center actually recommended discontinuing that study early because the 4C home device was so statistically significantly mm. better Mm -hmm. than the standard of care. So they actually recommended early study termination for efficacy, they called it. Um, but in that arm, so they had 760 people in the arm with the 4C home device. They had 750 people in the standard care. Each progressed to what about the same, about that 10 to 15-ish percent. Um, but again, 81% of those in the 4C home device had 20-40 vision or better, where we know most people, the study included is less than a third of people had better than 20, 40 vision or better um, with the standard of care model. 
And so by terminating the study early, that meant everybody would be, there would be no, uh, the study would be yeah, of course, there's no placebo group, but they would recommend everybody use it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it came down to, and that's how it um, okay. really got FDA approved. And just my personal impact since practicing this way, I've been um, very aggressive di diagnosing macular degeneration very early, probably for about eight, nine years of my career. I've incorporated the 4C home device for about the past four years. So in the past like three to four years, I have 13 of my own patients who between the 4C home device or just really close monitoring, 13 patients I caught that came in for their regular visit that were asymptomatic. By that, I mean, they noticed no changes to their vision. They noticed no change to their Amsler grid. They were 20, 25 or better in some cases. And by doing that and finding it early and sending it to my retina specialist, you know, they'll tell you that they're, those patients are few and far to come by, the super early ones. And they're the ones they like to treat the best because they respond really well. So some, I've had a couple of patients, two of them, in fact, that needed two or three injections and it resolved and it never came back. Others, they're still on them, but they were able to treat and then extend that protocol a lot faster um, than others that are a lot like, leaking a lot later before it was found. Um, and then still others were able to, after a year or two, actually still taper off the anti-VEGF drugs, uh, injections, where so many people that's like, now your new lifetime sentence is that you're going to need these injections at some level of interval, depending on, you know, forever. Glad, Linda. The obvious question is why don't all doctors use it? Why isn't it a standard of care? <laughs> Oh, I would love that. So Silly that's what, you know, you know, us us um on the front lines here, but that's our goal is to make it standard of care. I think the only reason why people are not adopting the 4C home device is lack of doctor education. Totally. Because the 4C home device is a hundred percent covered by Medicare. Yeah. It costs me as a doctor as a practice nothing to adopt it. The mm. 4C home company analyzes all of the stuff for me that I don't have to look at things every single day. I get a monthly report so I know my patients are taking it appropriately. But unless I get an alert, I'm not doing any of the work as the doctor. Like their monitoring site is doing it for me and then alerting me if there's a change. So it's no cost to me. It's no cost to the patient. You're only getting benefits. So I have no idea why it's not standard care. <laughs> but we're hoping to make it that way and get more doctors educated about it. What I've heard is that they, and this this is uh, this comes through patients, not through doctors, that they uh, there's a high rate of false positives. I mean, I haven't found that, and the the false positives that I've had, they had real metamorphopsia change. It just wasn't because of wet macular degeneration. So after my experience with it, both diagnosing what and not. Um, I just trust the device a lot that I, just from personal experience, I can say, I haven't had an alert where I bring them in and everything's exactly the same. Even that false positive was a change in his epiretinal membrane, which make, made sense. So I think that's, a no, it's a non-issue or it's false or, you know, maybe it was old that they were getting that back in the day, but they've been out, 4C Home now has been out, No Tall Vision is the company for years and they've perfected this over time and they've gotten better over time um, with me too. Um, just with my communication and their communications with patients. <laughs> I have to come mold the screen down here. Uh, once you have the device, do you use the 4C device indefinitely once you are diagnosed? No. So it's only approved for intermediate AMD um, to be covered by the insurance. So it is when you have intermediate AMD that it works. All right. So if you convert to wet, it's not applicable anymore, like you're done. Now that being said, you could still use it on the other eye that maybe didn't convert, but if you do convert to wet in both eyes, you know, it's, not, it's no longer useful anymore. I've also had two patients that because of how significant their drusen was, I mean, it was just mounds and mounds of drusen. There was so much metamorphopsia detected by the 4C device that they just said they couldn't establish like a, a, a good enough baseline that they could guarantee that they could diagnose a change. There was already so much metamorphopsia there that their company was just concerned they couldn't do it. But I mean, props to them that they're honest about it. The instrument couldn't calculate it by the, the algorithms that they use. Just like, maybe it's not worth it for this person anymore, which like, that's fine too. So he's back to his Amsler grid, but 
I see him, even though he's intermediate, he has no leakage. I see him in my office every six to eight weeks, just in case, um, because of how high risk he is with all of those changes. Okay, we have another question. Um, June asks, question, can you only get the device through the dog? Yeah, so that's going to be part of the issue, right, is that you can only get it through your doctor. I think that it's worth um, talking to your doctor about it because, again, it doesn't cost their practice anything, and they do all of the work. Like, literally all the doctor has to do or the practice is make a um, an account with no tall vision, which is super simple to do. They just need your, your information, your doctor and practice information. And when I recommend somebody to it, I literally fill out a one-page form and fax it to them, and they do everything else. So I usually tell my patients it takes like 48 hours for them to turn it around and call them, but they will already have talked to their insurance and know if you have a copay, exactly what that is, and they'll walk you through exactly what's needed to do to set it up in your house and make sure that you have everything that you need to get it going. They have really good customer service that way, too. It just sounds like a no-brainer to me, but... Yeah, doesn't okay. it? <laughs> me too. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, is there anything else about the 4C home, or should we just... Let does me any... see, because I have a couple of their, their, their hmm? words here. That, like, here's her... <laughs> okay. Right. So here is, like, what a typical what is diagnosed at at this point. Yeah. With this 20, 40 or worse vision, whereas the 4C home is catching like these teeny tiny bleeds that they had to, you know, enlarge right yeah. there. So these tiny ones really will not be detected by the Amber grid that well. It's the big yeah. difference. Yeah. And uh, then just how the reports look. So this is how my reports look when uh -huh. I get them. So the different like pink to red areas, it's like a topographical map. So it shows yeah. me exactly where the areas of metamorphopsia was and how big yeah. it is. And then it'll show you the change over time and everything too. Um, you don't need your own Wi-Fi. Um, if you don't have Wi-Fi, they have a hotspot that they'll give you that you plug in and it works. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. And it just talks, I, I would just talk to your doctor about it. The things I've heard pushed back from doctors are one, the false positive thing, which I really just haven't found to be true. And two, I've heard even some of my local retina specialists say, ah, it's not worth it. It's not any better than the Amsler grid. But I just explained to you why it is better than the Amsler grid. So again, I really think it's lack of education in the eye care world yeah. rather than like it not just taking off because something's wrong with the science or the instrument behind it. Do we have any questions? Uh, uh, we have a thank you for coming on. So I, I certainly thank you for that. Any questions before we talk about the other device? Yeah. Okay, so that was, the, uh, the 4C home is for people with intermediate AMD, but the home OCT that's still in, uh, it's still in clinical trials, right? It, they haven't submitted. Um, they haven't submitted for FDA approval. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so it's not approved by the FDA yet. The most yeah. recent study that came out from it was called a feasibility study. So uh -huh. because it depends so much on the person's vision and them performing it on themselves and, of course, communicating with a third party and then communicating with yeah. the doctor. So the study was run just that it was feasible in order to do this. So what they found is that it definitely is that 97% of the scans were usable that patients did on themselves at home. Yeah. It takes 40 to 60-ish seconds per eye. Um, and out of those, the algorithms were able to monitor for what they're calling um, fluid volume. So like the total amount across the retina, um, the fluid volume for changes over time. So similar to what the 4C home is, except now with the OCT, like the anatomy scans, now, mm -hmm. my understanding is that your retina specialist will also be able to view those scans day by day individually themselves, as well as that remote monitoring system, you know, helping and, and doing it with algorithms and their computer programs, too. Yep. Back to the 4C home. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I know the answer to this one, but uh, does it have to be a retina specialist that orders it? I love my off the month. No. Nope. No, nope. any not optometrist, for general ophthalmologist, yeah. retina specialist, it is not. And probably those who are in it with the 4C home is going mm. to be more like your local optometrist or somebody yeah. very 
um, invested in macular degeneration, who learned about it and incorporated yeah. it. But I mean, all I would say to your doctor, honestly, is that like, listen, I really think it's important for me. And I know that it's no cost to you. So do you think you can look into it? I mean, I just think that's a very reasonable question as a patient to ask your doctor. There's nothing in it that should hold them back from it. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Maddie, uh, no, uh, she uh, did say that, well, if, is it uh, not useful once you have wet AMD? It would be useful if you had one eye that was not wet yet. Correct. Right? But if you have Correct. both the eyes. The is good for intermediate AMD. Once you convert to wet, the, the metamorphopsia is too difficult to determine what's normal and not because of how subtlety the fluid can be. So that is going to be watched better with the anatomy scans, with the OCT scans at home. So yeah. once you convert to wet, if your retina specialist adopts that, the retina specialist will be the one to prescribe the home OCT. Right. Because that's for wet. Right. Whereas so, the 4C home device is going to be more your general ophthalmologist or optometrist in primary care. Right, right. Okay, so yeah. hopefully everybody has that now. The 4C home can be ordered by your optometrist, your ophthalmologist uh, for intermediate AMD. Now we'll talk more about what you would, uh, what hopefully will be available soon for the retinologist, ret <laughs> retinal specialist for wet AMD. All right, go ahead. The O. Yeah. And so, so the home OCT, it's going to do a couple of things for us. If you have that to monitor at home, what they're finding in some of their initial studies is that some people um, are resolving with their um, injection sooner on some drugs than others. So, you know, I know a lot of patients end up going through like the anti-VEGF roulette, like maybe Avastin didn't work, and now they do appeals with the insurance and they'll try Lucentis. Well, Lucentis is not working as well as we thought, so we'll try to make the insurance pay for ILEA, you know, and so on and so forth. So one, it's going to be able to let the retina specialist figure out sooner if injection works better for which person, just by watching how fast the fluid does resolve in between visits and then when it returns, right? when it recurs or comes back. So that'll be number one, it'll be easier to individualize it for patients. Um, step two then is it's going to be able to help hopefully like treat and extend faster. So if you're not leaking for a long time, maybe you don't need to come in for that visit every five weeks. Maybe we can watch it on the OCT for a little while until there's some fluid that's detected and then bring you in right away. Um, and then option three is maybe you leak sooner than when you come into your appointment. And do you leak at, you know, week two, at week three, at week four? And that's something we'll be able to track. And I think once it's more mainstream, it'll be fascinating to see the overall trends and analysis. Um, which one is it? It's Bayer has committed to doing a randomized clinical trial with ILEA to do, um, to compare ILEA with the treat and extend from the home OCT versus standard of care. So that's something in talks that will probably be happening to, you know, prove outcomes of this once it does get a, a FDA approval. I just want to, I just want to do something basic and that is to say that what you're talking about is a device at home that you would look through and it would do an OCT like you have in the office, right? Yep. And yep, the, exactly. Which, what does an OCT test look like? Is it, is it the one with the straight, the lines and the, yep. the curve? Yep, so the one, it gives us what we call a cross-section of the retina. So a picture okay. is just a 2D image of what we see inside of the eye. The OCT sort of does a cut between and turns it on its side so we can see yeah. all the individual layers of the retina. That's the test that will catch leakage usually before we can see it honestly with the with the slit lamp and the, the lights and the techniques that we have because it's so subtle because the interesting thing is the retina itself is actually a clear structure the light goes through it when you look at pictures of your retina and like pictures of the inside of the eye it all looks orangish and reddish because that's the vasculature that's the blood vessel underneath it but the retina is clear so if you're leaking not blood that's obvious it's, it's more obvious if you're leaking fluid, which is like the plasma component of the blood without the red blood cells. If you're leaking fluid, you're leaking clear fluid in a clear tissue. So it's just not visible to our human eyes until it's so bad. At some point we can see it. But the OCT will take it a lot easier. That was just somebody asked what the, 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 the same concept. Yeah. Yep. 
It's and called, so it's, it's the just same called exact called concept as the OCP right? we have in the office that yeah. we're using now. Mm -hmm. Sharon, did that, that answer your question? Yeah. It's just so it's simply by, called the, the almost. The company is no tall vision. It's N O T A L, mm -hmm. and they right. do both the four C home device and what will be the home OCT. Hopefully, the. I'll repost those links. I think I posted the link to each of those devices, but I'll repost them again. So. Yeah, and uh, I can do like a little recap for you too, and give you like a. Would it be for everybody with wet AMD, or just people who are? Uh, uh, well, who would it be for then? Then it's going to be, depending on your retina specialist, it's going to be the same thing. So yeah. it's going to be, once it's FDA approved and cleared, then it's just a matter of which doctor to sign up for it. And then, of course, they're going to have to figure out which insurance is paid for it. Like, it's going to be a process um, until people are, like, comfortable with it across the board. But it's going to be the same concept as the home, as the 4C home device right now, and that it's going to be doctor-centered. So it'll be up to your retina specialist to they adopt that technology to monitor it or not. Hopefully it takes off that it is, you know, standard of care, but unknowns at this point. And we expect that it will be covered by uh, uh, Medicare right away or will that come after a while? That uh, hopefully once they know that the FDA is going to approve when they get closer to that point, we'll know more. At this point, we don't know, but you know, they do cover the 4C home. There's a lot of data that shows how much it's improving. Um, and then you think, well, you know, long-term health care burden, if you're going to talk finances of the health care world and insurances, you're going to decrease their burden over time financially by catching it early, having less, you know, those anti-VEGF injections are $2,000 a shot sometimes. Yeah. So you're going to yeah. save the health insurances money that hopefully they see the financial gains on their end too, that won't be very difficult to get approved. Do you expect that it will also be no cost to the doctor? Uh, that is going to be true. Correct. So, in fact, my understanding is the retina specialist actually will get paid in order to look at those scans and, and um, see it in between visits, too. So, I think it's only going to be profitable to them, but it's neutral like we are now. Wow. So, there's zero reason not to adopt it. <laughs> yeah. Well, of the uh, third... And just my personal, going back to the 4C home, since I know a lot about that just currently is I, they have great customer service with those that aren't familiar with technology. You know, my patients are comfortable about it. Just some of them are 80 or early 90s. They're like, oh, I don't know about this technology stuff. Just trust the process. Like, I promise you, if it's a real, if it's a train wreck, like, let me know. Like, we'll send it back. It's fine. But I have not had a train wreck happen. They're able to um, do it pretty easily, even without Wi-Fi getting their own hotspot. A few patients that just sort of, First thought about it, got lots of days ago of it. They even have like a compliance section in no television that they'll call and be like, Are you having problems with the instrument? Is there some reason why you're not taking it? Do you just have a reminder? So they really keep up with the patients too, because the stipulation to have it paid by medical insurance is that you have to take it three times a week for them to pay for it. Which fine, they want to make sure that you're using an instrument that they're paying for, right? And that also makes me know that there'll be compliance with it too, as opposed to the Amsler grid that can just be, you know, on a fridge or wherever you keep it and you just forget it for a while, which life happens, I get. But it's just more incentive, we'll say, to keep doing it and give me the information. I'm just, well, I, I'm just in awe of, uh, of the technology, where it has been and where it's going. I mean, uh, just, Incredible. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, everybody... even just thinking about like echoes, echoes and, you know, Alexa and those kinds of things for people with low vision that can just ask for the weather, ask for the news and just hear everything mm -hmm. now. It's just even something as simple as that in technology is awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, you're right that uh, sometimes people don't use it because they're afraid of it because they don't they, they don't yeah. understand. You know, with education, right. my goodness. Um, I, that's no All excuse. I keep telling my colleagues over and over again is education never killed anyone. Not <laughs> to my knowledge. You can, yeah. you can educate. And, and I have some people that listen to me faithfully. And I have other people that are like, nah, how do you just feel that? I mean, fine, take it or leave it. But it's my job to give you the education. And then it's your health, it's your eyes. So you could be a team and decide with me. But I'm not going to hold a gun to your head to do any of these things either. 
you know, it's just, I think this is the best for you because of A, B, and C. And the majority of my patients do very well. I imagine that the is MacuLogic, right? Uh, wait, 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 wait. The company? Yep. I imagine they have the, a site. No tall vision. Oh, that's right. No tall vision. Yeah. There is a site where you can find a doctor who uses a device. Yep. So right on the no tall vision website, I, I'd have to Google it, but it's N O T A L. Uh -huh. Yep. So if you just vision. go to their website, you'll be able to find the doctors that participate in it. Mm -hmm. Putting your oh, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll uh, repost that link as well with, with the other link to the uh, information. Well, it's all on the same website. The information about the it's all on the same and website and again like as the patient when you can present it like it's it's the it's no cost to me hopefully with my insurance it's definitely no cost to you as the eye doctor and maybe you do think it's the same as the am card but it would make me feel better if i had it at home like if you think it would be cool like maybe sign me up again i think yeah. it's a very reasonable question to ask of your doctor wow wow that's awesome absolutely awesome yeah. Uh, I, I learned yeah, a lot. That's, and that's a big part of the reason I joined this group is that I've lectured to optometrists for years about macular degeneration. And there's there's some kind of wall that we just have to break through for this next phase of being able to really manage this disease well. And I feel like I've kind of hit the wall a little bit professionally and we're trying new things. But I would love to do like this grassroots movement, right? From like the patients up and like you guys start asking for it because there's science to back it up. Um, and it's gonna come from that direction too. So really not to be, you know, obviously jerks about it, but just like, hey doc, like I heard this this optometrist talk and it really sounded like it was something that um, I would like to try. Like I would just really like to try. So can you think about signing me up? Sounds great. Everybody's Thanks. human, right? We talk to each other yeah. like people. Somebody said a hug, Steve, both of you for this excellent information. I oh, agree. Good. Any questions? Uh, we don't want to let her get away without answering all of your questions. So what yep. else? Anybody? It's, uh, it's a special day today. They're either watching the Olympics or getting ready for the Super Bowl, right? I know, I didn't even think about the Super Bowl until today. I'm, I'm an Eagles fan, so these two teams are just very neutral to me. I have no feeling. I think I'm just going to root for the offense. <laughs> they're, they're, playing, uh, they're, they're playing later anyway. Okay, we have another question. What about one eye wet and what, uh, one eye with uh, geographic atrophy from the 4C home? So the 4C home can do intermediate AMD with 2060 vision or better. So you could, so you know, atrophic or geographic atrophy does start in these teeny tiny areas first. So you can still take it up to the point that you're no longer 2060 or better. Or, you know, at some point if there's just so much atrophy, probably like my patient with those mounds of drusen, at some point we might get an alert that says like, we just can't get a baseline to really know that this is going to detect some, some real change in the future. So you might max out on it at some point. Um, but as long as it's intermediate and you're better than 2060, you can still use the device. Well, isn't non-focal, uh, non-foveal uh, geographic atrophy considered intermediate? Yeah, it's part of it. Yeah. I mean, technically, if you have, like, again, we're getting into technicalities, right? And if you're just, like, yeah. staging macular degeneration, it's all, like, arbitrary in a way. You know, it was scientists yeah, it looking at it and delineating, like, all right, this is the finding that we're going to say is intermediate. But yeah. we know that macular degeneration is like a continuum of it events. Is, yeah. So, so by ARA's definition, if you start to have like geographic atrophy of any kind, you're technically in late stage geographic atrophy. Now that being said, like you said, if it's not direct in the fovea, it could be a little bit off to the side. You might have a little blind spot or an area of metamorphopsia here, but everything else might still be perfectly fine. So that 4 home device would still work. And it can mm. even watch that specific area if it gets larger over time or changes. It would alert me to that too. Again, until you're less than 2060, or if it's just not comfortable establishing your baseline to reliably detect changes in the future, which the company would tell us for your individual eye. And so it depends on uh, the doctor's uh, uh, diagnosis. They have to diagnose it as intermediate AMD and. Some people with geographic atrophy will get diagnosed as intermediate, correct? Sure. Okay. 
<laughs> All right, here's a good yeah. question. This is <laughs> I mean, more. To me, if you're 26 feet or better and you have some geographic atrophy, like yes. you're you're a candidate for the 4C home device until you're not. There so. you go. Okay. Um, all right, uh, one last question, which is a more general question, but a good one. What are the three most important questions we should ask our doctor during a visit? Hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it to macular degeneration. This is the, yeah. Yeah. the group. But I would say to know about your macular degeneration, just in general, do I have any drusen? Like, are there signs of aging in my eye at all? And if there are, how severe is it? Is it just a little bit? Is it early? Is it intermediate? And how do you know? Right? How do you know? So those questions, if they were posed to me, was yes or no, you have drusen. I'll tell you if you're early or intermediate based on how they look by the A-RED study. But to me also, it depends on the dark adaptation, which we talked a lot about in the yeah. first um, lecture that I did, in that yeah. some people progress with deterioration of the function of their vision with regards to dark adapt before they deteriorate with regards to their anatomy. So that's a whole other discussion than that other lecture. But so to me personally as a doctor, like thinking about big picture and not being stuck into a box of early, intermediate, late, it's who's progressing faster with their dark adapt is getting worse. Like I think they probably have intermediate or they're gonna progress more than somebody who has the same exact looking drusen but their dark adapt isn't changing at all or is changing very, very little comparatively. So even if their drusen look the same, I'm monitoring them different. And I, I don't do the genetic testing in my office, and you know we can talk about that as, at another time too, but just taking in their family history in general into account, like did your mom and dad both have wet? Like that's you know a red flag. We can't, as you've said many times, we can't predict the genetics of it. But you're more likely probably to have it than somebody who's never had it anywhere in their family line ever before that they know of. So it's just these little pieces of each individual that I would take into account and, um, you know, say early, intermediate, late, or where you're at. Um, and then if there's anything to do about it. Yeah. Uh, we have someone whose seven-year-old son was diagnosed with macular degeneration. Now, that, that's not the type of macular degeneration you're talking about. Correct. So I'm going to guess it's some kind of like genetic hereditary macular dystrophy is a similar term used. Mm -hmm. um, macular degeneration can happen earlier in life than what we think of 60s, 70s up, but I've never heard a pediatric of it personally, unless somebody wants to correct it, but I haven't. So I'm going to guess it, it might be something similar that you lose a center of vision. There's lots of diseases that cause that. Um, but I would ask about like an exact diagnosis for that little one. I'll say too, if it's something that is genetic to ask your eye doctor, there is a company called Spark, S-P-A-R-K. They yeah. do an inherited retinal disease panel, genetic panel, over 200 retina diseases. Here's the thing, it's free to me as the doctor, free. it's free to you as the patient, and yeah. you get a free hour of genetic counseling afterwards too. Well, is, if your eye doctor hasn't offered you that for that little guy, I would bring that up because it's no cost to anybody and you can find out a lot of information about like hereditary retina issues that way. Is it's that not a for, generational is, culture out there now? Is that just for people in the US? Do you know? Yes. It is? Yeah. Okay. That may be somebody who's yeah, not. Yeah, so I use that regularly too because there are some things that look like macular degeneration, there's not. Yeah. And then they also, all those hereditary retinal diseases and macular dystrophies, they also overlap a ton, how they look and how they're presented, their symptoms present. So that I utilize a lot that is super helpful. And again, totally free to everybody involved, which is an, another no-brainer. Yeah. We have a general question. Is there anything that someone with wet macular degeneration needs to absolutely avoid? I don't think so. I'll say say one I... thing, and that is uh, somebody with wet macular degeneration should avoid not calling a doctor if there's a change. You need <laughs> to call a doctor Correct, yeah. if you have. I mean, even if you're not pain. sure, I mean, I guess not all, di all eye doctors are as, as nice. But like, if I have a patient call that they have new flashes and floaters, or they have a sudden change to your vision, like that you're seeing me today, tomorrow, or you're seeing me Monday, like it's over the weekend. I'm, we have in our schedule just like built in empty slots for emergencies because we have that many 
that we normally get on a routine basis. So we see patients commonly like, the same day. And I tell them all the same thing. Like, oh, I'm so sorry I brought you in. Like, I'm so sorry I wasted your time. Like, you didn't waste anything. Because if you have a change to your vision, I can't tell you if it's from macular degeneration or something else over the phone. Yeah. I can't tell you, you know, if there's if that change to your vision is from, you know, A, B, C, or D. So it's like, let's come in and check it out. Mm -hmm. That's what the medical insurance is there to pay for, especially with, you know, most patients with macular degeneration with Medicare. Um, like, I can bill those insurances for any medical reason or diagnosis. It doesn't matter how many times I see you a year. There's no limit to it. So all it's doing is giving us an answer to things you're going to drive yourself with in your own mind until you get the answer some way in the future. The, the person with the seven-year-old's in Trinidad, and uh, they're saying that yeah. uh, services there are very limited. It's a shame. It probably is, yeah, depending on remotes and traveling. I'm sure that it is. It's very different in other countries. Yeah. Um, anything else? The I think that's the major points that I wanted to cover today, but I'm always open to other topics that members have questions about, um, either for a little post or another Facebook Live like this. Yeah, I think, but the next time we do a Facebook Live, we figure oh whether the key is do we both have to be on iphones <laughs> because i know it seems like i tried to get on with a laptop and you tried with your devices so i tried an ipad first and then this yeah. And, yeah. well we'll figure it so, out i have to figure it out before thursday to get dr stringham on so we'll figure this out yeah which i'm excited to, to listen to him talk too so i will yeah. do that all right well thanks to you so very much. We are definitely going to have you back. So welcome. Plenty of things that we can talk about. So we'll. I'm we'll sure that there is. Anytime. Thank you. Like Thank I said, you. we're here on this grassroots movement, right? I'm here with you, so it's exciting. All right, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, everybody. You're welcome. Bye bye. Yep. Bye, bye. everybody.